Now we continue our coverage of this Stephen Avery trial with Anjanette Levy live now with analysis on today's events. Anjanette. Well, good evening, Tom. Uh, our legal analyst, Rob Bellin of Hammett Bellin and Oswald is joining us. He's a criminal defense attorney. And Rob, thanks for joining us. First of all, if you would talk to us a little bit about this issue with um, the contamination possibly of the bullet. Sherry Colhane said she was pretty confident that her DNA was not present on the bullet and that only Teresa Hallbuck's DNA was there. But what, okay. what do you have to say about that? Well, they obviously had numerous samples of DNA and she testified that they uh, tested 180 different items. So this is a pretty complex process. And for the defense, if there's any break in the integrity of that process, I think they obviously have an obligation to jump all over that and to explore that. And you can expect they're going to do that because if there is one part of this process where the integrity breaks down, how can anybody be sure that these other parts of the process didn't have the, a similar type of breakdown? So whether it's the bullet itself or one of the control samples or whatever, I think the credibility of this witness is bolstered by the fact that she helped exonerate Mr. Avery, um, but the fact that mistakes can be made when the stakes are this high in this type of investigation, um, I, I think obviously the defense is going to score a lot of points with that. Okay, it's something we haven't touched on. Uh, the defense has renewed its motion to suppress all of the evidence on the Avery property due to what they call some false statements and affidavits. They said they heard some testimony that this was a missing persons case when they got on the scene. And now they're hearing, uh, or pardon me, that they were investigating a homicide, but everybody's saying, no, we were investigating a missing person's case. Talk to me about what you think about that. Uh, I think that, that it, it's not real sensational type testimony and, and it's a lot of legal argument, mm -hmm. but actually it's very important. I mean, the defense is asking for a lot of evidence to be suppressed. Of course, if that would get suppressed, the state's entire case could potentially fall mm -hmm. apart. So it's very important, it's very crucial. And what the defense has pointed out today is that there may actually be inconsistent testimony. Officers testified one way at a motion hearing under oath and now they're testifying differently mm -hmm. at trial and you know obviously that's very serious allegations. I think the the um, attorney Fallon made his arguments he seemed to be somewhat upset by it because what you're really saying is that you know these these officers are not telling the truth. Mm -hmm. Now they term it as inconsistent testimony but that as as a basis to renew their motion to suppress this evidence along with the re reason reasonableness of this, these searches because they're saying that you know these searches were they had some cursory searches and then it blew up into bigger searches but that again they're saying it's inconsistent that you have an affidavit that's inconsistent with testimony and additional testimony that's inconsistent so uh, these are pretty important issues and I think if they can win on that it would be huge. Okay thank you very much and Judge Willis did not rule on that motion yet um, he will do so he said at a later time. Tom? All right thanks Anjanette. Anjanette Levy with our CBS 5 legal analyst Rob Bellin in Chilton this evening and for more coverage of this trial, including courtroom journals from Chris and Anjanette, just go to our website, WFRV.com slash Avery. Two men were killed. Caps are reached. Well, the second week of the Stephen Avery murder trial wrapped up with the DNA expert who helped exonerate uh, Avery of rape charges four years ago. Analyst Sherry Colhane told the jury the DNA is found in every body fluid like blood, saliva, and semen. Colhane linked bone fragments from the burn pit on Avery's property to Teresa Hallbach and on a bullet found in Stephen Avery's garage. Colhane admitted, though, that when she tested this bullet, her own DNA got into the mix. Were there any other profiles developed on the bullet besides Teresa Hallbox? No. Colhane testified the mistake was made when she was training some analysts. She also testified that she cleans her workstation several times a day to prevent contamination. But this could be the break Avery's defense team was looking for. Not only was this test abnormal in the way it was used, but you don't even know how abnormal. That's all I can say at this time. But if you listen on Monday, you will find out just how abnormal this test was to be used against Mr. Avery. And the defense will cross-examine Colhane on Monday morning and try to capitalize on that testimony. And we will have much more on all of week two coming up in our next half hour. The uh, two men... Five ninety nine at Fox Communities Credit Union. Helping you feel smart about your money. Yes, you can. From WFRV TV, this is CBS 5 News Weekend with Chris Schuler, meteorologist Dave Miller, and sports with Burke Griffin. Now CBS 5 News Weekend, working for you. 
Welcome back, everyone. The second week of testimony in the trial of Stephen Avery focused on physical evidence, who found it, then how and when it was collected. Avery and his nephew Brendan Dassey are accused of murdering Teresa Holbach on Halloween of 2005 and then burning her body. Now, Avery was convicted of rape in 1985 and exonerated in 2003 by DNA evidence. Dassey also faces a sexual assault charge, though. A charge filed against Avery was dropped before trial started due to a lack of physical evidence. Now, forensic scientist John Ertl from the Wisconsin State Crime Lab started testimony this week. Ertl looked through burn barrels in Stephen Avery's burn pit. Ertl said he also tested the floor in Avery's garage. The prosecution believes Avery shot Holbach in that garage. Avery's attorney, Jerome Butin, pointed out that mistakes may have been made. Now, Calumet County Sheriff uh, Sergeant Bill Tyson testified that the Manitowoc County Sheriff's deputies involved in the initial investigation all acted professionally at the crime scene at all times. By the way, the three of you didn't plant any blood while you were doing that, did you? No. On Tuesday, Avery's defense grilled Sergeant Tyson. Tyson said he was ordered to supervise Manitowoc County Sheriff's Sergeant Andy Colborn, Lieutenant Jim Link, and Detective Dave Remaker as they searched Avery's trailer. That, of all places, you knew was important that you make sure that these Manitowoc officers not be alone. Correct. And so you kept an eye on them, didn't you? I was watching what they were doing, yes. Had you ever, in any of your years as an officer, had to watch the officers who were searching where you were to make sure that they weren't alone? No. Items seized that night, handcuffs, leg irons, and a notebook listing Holbach's cell phone number. Jerome Butin focused on what wasn't found, though, the key to Holbach's car. And would you agree with me that it was, would have been very difficult for Lieutenant Link or Sergeant Colburn to have planted a Toyota key in that residence under your watch? I believe it would have been difficult. All right, our legal analyst Rob Bellin joins us now. And Rob, uh, you know, they're talking about evidence the first couple days of the trial. There's some, uh, actually some real bizarre circumstances here. Like you heard, this is the first time that uh, Mr. Tyson ever had to watch other officers yeah. do their job. So that sort of supports the fact that, uh, you know, even Calumet County may have seen there could be some problems with Manitowoc. Um, however, they counter that with Tyson saying, I, I did watch them. I'm an unbiased, you know, in, in, investigator here, and there's no way that they could have done anything on my watch. All right. That was a theme that came up quite often. Now, uh, later in the day, Manitowoc County Sergeant Andy Colborn and Lieutenant Jim Link, they took the witness stand. They claim they said the claim by the defense that uh, they planted evidence over a lawsuit filed by Avery for his wrongful rape conviction was ridiculous. An immediate. Have you ever planted any evidence against Mr. Avery? That's ridiculous. Have no, you? I have not. I have to say that this is the first time my integrity has ever been questioned. Now, Stephen Avery's attorney, Dean uh, Strang, didn't ask Colburn one question about planning evidence, specifically the blood vial. The state asked the court to tell the jury to disregard any references to it. You heard all the questioning about the vial of blood in the clerk's office in jury selection. You heard the contamination in press releases you heard the contamination in opening statements. Now, for the first time when evidence should be placed into, into uh, the record or at least placed into this particular case, we hear nothing. I'm idealistic. I'm certainly naive at times, but I am not so naive to think that someone who may have planted blood evidence, who may have been involved in planting a key, would come into this courtroom and simply because asked under oath, did you do it? say, oh yes, I did. We are not going to have a Perry Mason moment here. All right, Rob, let's talk about that because uh, you know the vial of blood came up all the time. He didn't ask one officer in the center of that anything about it. Well, I, I think 
you know, Ken Kratz is doing his job, but I have to agree with Dean Strang here. I mean, if, if anyone thinks that Lank or Colburn are going to get on the stand and say that, yeah, we planted evidence mm -hmm. against Mr. Avery, that's ridiculous. Of course they're not going to say that. So uh, in some ways, cross-examining on, on that it may be a waste of time. And they did answer the question on direct. So at this point, it's way too premature. The defense still hasn't even gotten to their case mm -hmm. and let the defense put on their evidence and then see what they come up with. All right, but as we find out, uh, the very next day on Wednesday, Lieutenant Link defended himself against allegations that he planted Avery's blood in Teresa Holbach's SUV. Avery's attorneys say Link, an evidence custodian for the department, knew the blood was there and could have planted it. Link said he found out the vial of blood was sitting in the clerk's office last December. Did you ever plant it anywhere in Teresa Halbach's vehicle or anywhere where it could be found as part of this investigation? No, sir, definitely not. Lieutenant Link also testified about finding Teresa Halbach's car key on the seventh search of Avery's bedroom. I informed the other two officers that there's a key laying on the floor and it was not there before. Uh, they all looked at it. At that point, Deputy Kucharski photographed it and subsequently collected it. Lieutenant Link, let me just ask you, were you surprised to see that key? Yes, sir, I was. Why? It wasn't there before. After the collection of the key, did you, Deputy Kucharski and Sergeant Colburn, attempt to ascertain where the key had come from or do some further investigation? Yes, we did. Tell the jury what kind of investigation you did, please. We looked at the cabinet, um, at the back corner of the cabinet. We saw that there was an opening between the back of the cabinet and the uh, side, approximately a half to an inch and we believed that that's where the key had fallen from the cabinet. Do you suppose that if, if a defense lawyer stood up and asked you, did you plant blood in Teresa Halbach's car, do you suppose you'd tell me? Yes, sir. You think I you did would? not. All right, who do you think won here? We have the two main players, the two cops who planted, allegedly planted the evidence. Well, I think it depends what you're looking at. The, the, you've got a couple issues. Uh, Ken Kratz is going to try to strike this theory of defense instruction, mm -hmm. but that's way too premature. Then, really, one thing that stands out is this car key. I don't think we've heard an adequate explanation how it's on the sixth or seventh search. They come in, there's a picture of this key on the ground next to these slippers, and no one saw that at any mm -hmm. time earlier. And the only explanation we have so far is that there was a cabinet nearby and they think it fell out of the cabinet. Why didn't someone hear it or see it fall when they were moving the cabinet or searching the cabinet? And why haven't we seen the actual cabinet as to how this even could have happened? So no. I, what strikes me is that it, it seems to be very bizarre how that key just sort of magically appeared. Most murder trials are fairly bizarre, though, aren't they? Well, that's true. You never know what's going to come up at a trial. That's true. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Rob. Hey, we'll have uh, more on Wednesday's testimony, and we're going to hear a voicemail left by Holbach on the day that she went missing. That's later on. And winter storm warnings are in effect for tonight through tomorrow through a good portion of northeastern Wisconsin, and blizzard warnings are in effect for areas down to the south. Well, a complete forecast coming up. Okay, tonight. We're on. New Sepacol plus coating relief lozenges, stronger medicine ends your sore throat emergency. And welcome back, everybody, as we look back at the past week in the Stephen Avery murder trial. Manitowoc County Detective Dave Remaker also testified on Wednesday. Now, he said that Lieutenant Link assigned him to head up the Manitowoc County end of the investigation into Teresa Holbach's disappearance. Remaker said he and Lieutenant Link interviewed Avery at his home the morning after Holbach was reported missing. I think my comments were, I think Kelly McCowney is barking up the wrong tree. I think we both were in agreement at the time that... Steve had nothing to do with it. That was just our feeling. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, he was a prosecution witness at the time. Well, it's obvious that uh, Ken Kratz is trying to use that testimony to combat this tunnel vision theory that the defense is trying to put forward. Right, right. So they're saying, you know, that this, um, there's no way that they just honed in on Stephen Avery. Not only did they uh, maybe think someone else was involved, they didn't even think Mr. Avery was involved. So that's obviously to combat that part of the defense, and it depends. If the jury finds Detective Remaker to be credible, mm -hmm. that, then that's good evidence for the state. All right, good insight. 
website. Hey, on the second day of the search, uh, Remaker said he found a voice message uh, from Teresa Holbach on Barb Yanda's home machine. Remaker said the message was left on Halloween before noon. Stephen Avery called Auto Trader Magazine that morning using the name B. Yanda to request Holbach so she could photograph the van his sister was selling. Hello, this is Teresa with Auto Trader Magazine. I'm um, photographer, and I'm just giving a call to let you know that I could come out there today um, in the afternoon. And it would probably be around 2 o'clock or even a little later. Um, if you could please give me a call back and let me know if that'll work for you because I don't have your address or anything. Now, uh, Ken Kratz uh, defended playing that voicemail because he said it was uh, helping set up the whole timeline for things. What do you think about that? I think it's undisputed that uh, Teresa Halbach was there at that property. So in a way, this could be considered cumulative evidence and they don't even need it. Um, but, you know, uh, Ken Kratz done a good job. He got it in and now he can make his argument that these people are hearing from Teresa Halbach, like he said in his opening, mm -hmm. that, you know, Teresa Halbach's going to tell you who did this. You're going to hear from her. And he's set that up well. An emotional tug as well. Absolutely emotional. All right. On a Thursday, Calumet County Deputy Dan Kaharski told jurors about seeing Sergeant Colburn and Lieutenant Link the day Teresa Holbach's RAV4 key was found in Stephen Avery's bedroom. Now, the defense says Colburn and Link planted that key. Special Prosecutor Ken Kratz asked Kaharski whether the key could have been planted. Yes, I guess it is possible. Right. And is that in the sense of Anything's possible? That's in the sense of it's possible aliens put it there, I guess. Right. You are not watching Link and Colburn to be sure that they did not plant evidence, right? That, that's correct. Back to that key, he said it could have been possible. And, and I think that's actually some typical police speak because that's how sometimes the, the police come off at a, at a trial to say, yeah, it's possible, but you know that it's so far remote. But I think that this actually helps the defense because I think that looks somewhat unprofessional uh, on behalf of the police officer. And they've already established that someone should be watching these Manitowoc officers. Now there's uh, Mr. Kuharski and he's not watching. Mm -hmm. That's a perfect plays right into the defense's argument. Hmm. All right. The state arson investigator also took the stand. Special Agent Kevin uh, Heimroll examined remnants in the Avery's burn pit and found evidence believed to be linked to, uh, Stephen, Avery, uh, to Stephen Avery and Teresa Holbach, a, a rivet from a pair of blue jeans. It was this clothing rivet that was identified, uh, easily identified or at least identified with writing uh, right on the rivet? Yes. And what does the rivet say? The rivet is stamped Daisy Fuentes. Now I understand uh, you kind of have a problem with the rivet because they only found one rivet. And something else, you know, you'd wonder why one rivet survived, mm -hmm. but there wasn't a button or any other rivets. Absolutely. However, this is still some pretty good testimony for the state. You know, it's like the icing on the cake um, showing, you know, that the, Teresa Halbach may have been there, and then, of mm -hmm. course, bringing on uh, uh, Teresa's sister to testify mm -hmm. about those mm -hmm. genes. All right. After the break, uh, you were talking about the sister. We're going to hear more about that rivet from Teresa Halbach's sister. CBS 5 News is brought to you by Dr. Stephen Dudley and Dr. Gerald Clark of Optivision Laser Centers. Voted best LASIK surgeons in the area. Save 25% off. 35 on CBS 5. On the final day of uh, week two, the sister of Teresa Holbach connected her murdered sister with evidence found in a burn pit near Avery's home. Teresa's 15-year-old sister, Katie Holbach, said she remembered teasing Teresa after she showed her a pair of Daisy Fuentes jeans that she'd bought. Investigators found rivets, as we said earlier, from that brand of jeans in the burn pit on Avery's property where Holbach's bone fragments were also found. She also told jurors she got a blue lanyard at EAA two years ago and gave it to Teresa as a gift. The fob 
job with Teresa's car key found in Steve Avery's trailer a few days after her disappearance. Also on uh, Friday, a juror was dismissed due to a death in the family, leaving now 15 jurors. And Dean Strang renewed a motion to suppress all of the evidence seized from Stephen Avery's trailer, garage, burn pit, and burn barrels. Now, Strang's motion was denied last year. He says law enforcement violated the one warrant, one search principle. Strang says Avery's burn pit should have been searched that first night. Now, Judge Willis will rule on this motion at a later date. Following those arguments, uh, Teresa Hallbach's 15 year old sister Katie took the stand and talked about that rivet that we spoke of earlier. How do you know that she had a pair of Daisy Fuentes jeans? Uh, well one day she showed me a new pair of jeans she had and I noticed that the brand was Daisy Fuentes and I knew that Daisy Fuentes was an older person so I told Teresa that she has old person jeans. You showed us the rivets. What's um what do you what do you close the waist <coughs> with on these jeans? A button. Does that kind of look like the more or less like the rivets, except a little bit bigger? Yeah. A tug at the heartstrings there with Katie, but also let's talk about this uh, motion that they are renewing once again. Uh, actually, I think that that motion is is very important. It was uh, denied. The motion had been made back in June, and now they're making some serious allegations that uh, police officers have some inconsistent testimony, giving me a basis to renew the motion. Uh, but in Wisconsin, there has never been a case on point on this one search, one warrant principle. Mm -hmm. So I think if there is a conviction in this case, you're probably gonna be seeing some new law made uh, from our Supreme Court on that issue. All right. Hey, the uh, DNA analyst whose work freed Stephen Avery from prison testified. She presented damning evidence against Stephen Avery. Sherry Culhane told the jury that six blood stains in Teresa Holbach's SUV contained Stephen Avery's DNA profile. And Holbach's RAV4 key contained Avery's DNA. Colhane said Avery's DNA profile occurs once in every four quintillion people. Colhane said a bullet fragment from Avery's garage had Hallbach's DNA on it. Were there any other profiles developed on the bullet besides Teresa Hallbach's? No. Was Teresa Hallbach's profile the only profile that you found on that bullet? Yes. Were there any mixtures? No. Now, Carl Hayne uh, testified that her DNA got into a sample used to monitor that testing process for contamination. I felt as if I was far enough away from my workbench not to introduce my DNA, but apparently I was incorrect. Now, your DNA was <coughs> did not come up on the bullet, did it? No. Obviously, though, I mean, this is a big break for the defense to jump on. Uh, this is a huge break for the defense. I even have cases where I've had lab analysts' DNA show up in a sample, and you start to question the whole process. So the state's going to say that this, you know, didn't actually affect any of this process here. But I think, you know, you can expect that the defense is going to jump all over this and question the whole process. And how hard is it to argue to a jury, you know, this, this um, analyst has been doing this for 23 mm -hmm. years. Why doesn't she watch CSI and decide to, you know, wear a mask? I know, when I heard that, I was going, ooh. All right. All right. For extended coverage, everybody, including courtroom journals from myself and Anjanette Levy, just go to our website, wfrv.com slash Avery. Well, the snow is uh, starting to come down, and Dave Miller will join us.